Good morning, everybody. It's about nine o'clock, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully, everybody can see and hear me okay. Welcome to our very first episode of Wildland Stories. Um, it's a new series. And I'm very, very excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think we're going to learn to, we're going to get to learn a lot of great things and meet a lot of wonderful people. My name is Gabrielle Hardin. I am the forestry extension educator here at Utah State University. I am joined by two lovely people today. I have my co-host, Darren McAvoy. He is an ex a forestry extension assistant professor here. And we have the wonderful Dr. Larissa Yocom, who is an assistant professor at Utah State in fire ecology. She got her master's in environmental science at Yale and her PhD in forest ecology at Northern Arizona. She is interested in fire ecology and management. Her current research focuses on fire severity, fuel treatment efficacy, and post-fire regeneration. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys know what today is going to be like. This is not going to be your typical presentation webinar. We're going to do a little interview. We're gonna have some fun. So for the first portion, Darren and I are going to take turns asking Larissa some fun questions about fire ecology. The second portion is going to be like a rapid fire section. You guys submitted a lot of questions. So we are just going to let her have those questions. There's so many, I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them today, but we're going to do our best. Um, so I'm not gonna hold this back anymore. Larissa, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me. This is gonna be fun. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here. So the very first question, we're gonna start out super easy, but it could be kind of hard. <laughs> what is fire ecology? Okay, well, actually, thanks everyone for being here. It's really exciting to see people from all over the country. And I even saw someone from out of the United States in the chat. So it's really a neat opportunity to get to talk about fire with so many people. Okay, so fire ecology is uh, the study of fire and how it interacts with its environment everything from the soil to the plants to animals, um, even to the air and aquatic ecosystems. And so um, people who are fire ecologists study things like how many plants or trees fires kill. They study things like what happens after a fire, what, what regenerates and what comes back after a fire. Um, they study things like historical fire, how often did fires used to burn and how has that changed? Um, and then fire ecology also includes um, the studying how we can better manage our ecosystems and better manage fire. There isn't really a separate subfield for that. So a lot of fire ecologists are interested in, in prescribed fire and, and things that um, contribute to good management of fire. So it's really, it's really, it's, it's this kind of, it's all of the interactions with, of fire with its environment. It's, it's, so it's a really broad term and kind of encompasses almost anything you can think of um to do with wildland fire yeah great introduction th thanks gabrielle thanks larissa great start um it occurs to me as we lead up to this larissa i don't know if you've ever gotten this question before but i wonder if some people in our audience think of fire and ecology as kind of opposites that fire is you read the paper and fire is a destroyer it it, it it ruins forests. It uh, it destroys forests. Those are all the words that we hear when we when we read about a fire. And how could fire be part of ecology if it ruins and destroys everything? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that that's a different perspective that fire ecologists tend to have, as they think of fire as a natural part of the ecosystem. It's been around as long as we have had plants on the earth, enough plants and enough oxygen on the earth for it to burn. And so it, it really, you know, it was here long before people. And it's really the fact that we have moved into these ecosystems. We have a lot more people on the planet now um, in homes in some fire prone areas where, you know, we are noticing that it can have some detrimental effects. So yeah, good question, but it really is a natural part of some ecosystems. And some ecosystems are really actually dependent on fire to maintain their function. So we can talk about that throughout the morning, but, um, yeah, it is, it doesn't, it, there's, it can have negative consequences for people, but in a lot of cases, it is a natural part of, of natural ecosystems. Gabrielle. Yeah, so, so now we know a little bit about what fire ecology is and how it's a bit um, naturalized on the landscape, but could you tell us exactly what is a fire ecologist? I mean, what is it that you do? Um, what are fire ecologists studying? Just, 
And what is that? Okay, well, so to define it somewhat narrowly, so, so someone with a fire ecology title would be someone, a scientist who is studying one of those aspects of fire, either mortality, regeneration, historical fire, fire climate relationships, even you know um, how people fit into the world of fire. Um, there's a lot of a lot of subfields as I already talked about, but basically, and you know, as any ecologist, you're a, a, a fire ecologist is using established ways of sampling to get unbiased results and then trying to learn something to push our knowledge forward in one of these areas of fire ecology. But there are also a lot of people without the, the title fire ecologist who work in fuels, for example, with agencies that I think are doing some, you know, some fire ecology work because they have to understand how fire works and how it moves and the things that affect how it burns in order to do their jobs well. So I think, you know, narrowly it's the study of one of these, you know, how fire interacts with its environment as a scientist. But I think more broadly, it's really people who are working to better understand how, how it behaves and how it affects ecosystems in order to do, um, in order to manage our, our, our lands well. So knowing all of that, could you tell us, like, how did you, were you always fascinated with fire? Is this something you've always been passionate about? Or was this something that one day in your 20s, you were like, whoa, this is super cool. I have to go after this. <laughs> it was more of the second thing. So I've always been really interested in natural resources and land management. That started because I grew up in Western Washington. Um, my parents had 40 acres of land that I grew up on and they built their own log house. Um, and so I was surrounded by these forests. And I remember when I was a kid, the, some of those logging wars in the Northwest where uh, people were um, losing jobs, their logging jobs. My, one of my best friends, dad was a logger and um, was out of work. And I just, I, that somehow sunk in with me as a kid. And, but I also loved, I loved the being outside running around in the woods. And so um, I think those, you know, I was, I was pretty interested in natural resource management probably unnaturally so for a kid. And I just followed that through um, until actually after my master's degree, I took a step back and thought, what do I really want to spend my time on? And I decided that drought and fire were the big issues in um, the Western North America that I really wanted to focus on. So I, it, was a, it was a deliberate decision that I came to in my 20s. That's awesome. That sounds like a really dreamy place to grow up. <laughs> So you said a couple of things I want to follow up on, uh, Larissa. One is uh, you mentioned the word fuels. Now I'm going to play somewhat uh, jargon police uh, as okay. part of my role. And it's, please define what that means. Well, in another word for plants would be fuels. So that's, uh, you know, in the fire world, it could be living plants or dead, like needles, branches, uh, leaves that are falling off the off of trees. But really, um, anything that can burn. And so, um, and that, that tends to be, um, it's plant material. So living or dead plant material. Okay. Another thing I wanted to follow up on, you mentioned um, growing up and seeing your friend's uh, dad go out of, biz uh, out of business, who was a logger. I just want to share with the audience, I saw what, or, or listened to a great podcast last week called uh, Timber Wars. I found out about it through Outside Magazine, and it's a couple of days, or it's maybe a day long, the, the total thing. And it kind of explains what Larissa was referring to in, in the how we came to this point in the environmental uh, movement and, and, and the, the war between the environmental movement and timber in the Northwest. I just wanted to put in a little plug, and it, I thought it was a really good presentation along that line. So. But I want to go on with the next question. Have you ever start, started a fire yourself? I have, yep. I first handled a drip torch in Alabama. Um, I was on- A, a drip a, torch, excuse me? What, what is a drip yep. torch? So a drip torch is a tool that um, prescribed fire managers, firefighters use to start fires. It's filled with a mix of a couple types of fuel and there's a wick on the end so that burning fuel can be dripped across the ground without you know, having to bend down with a match, for example. Um, and so it was a piece of private land that our host was ready to burn. And we, as I, I went down there with a class and we were able to, um, to start this piece of property on fire. So that was my, that was, yep, that was, it was an eye-opening experience. I have pictures of myself 
because it was private land, there weren't as many regulations as, and, and we have people from all over all over the country, so some from the Southeast as well. Maybe some of you have done this, but um, we didn't have, well, maybe this was not very smart, but we didn't have personal protective equipment. We just, I was out there in my jeans and t-shirt um, starting these, these woods on fire. It was pretty fun. Have you lit a bunch of fires since then? Is this a common thing that a fire ecologist might do? Uh, no, I wish I could, but that's not been my job. Um, a lot of times you don't have the, you know, uh, ability to, it would be great if we could go start experimental for it, fires all over the place, but a lot of times you have to wait and be more opportunistic with the places that you study. Um, yeah. I want to follow up a little bit also on the fire ecology thing. You are a professor, uh, assistant professor here at Utah State University. What other organizations or places might a person work for with that title as a fire ecologist? Yeah, so universities is one place, but then there are fire ecologists working. So research fire ecologists working for, for example, the Rocky Mountain Research Institution. And there's a research arm of the Forest Service and that Rocky Mountain one is the one in the West, um, but there are research arms of the, for there's a research arm of the Forest Service with offices all over the country. There are also um, the, U uh, the USGS, which is the United States Geological Survey also has um, fire ecologists working with them. Um, and then National Forests, which is a different arm of the Forest Service has fire ecologists. So they would work at, a for, at the forest level. Um, for example, the Uinta Wasatch Cache is our local national forest and there's a fire ecologist that works in that, in that forest to help guide um, forest management from that perspective. And then national parks, there are a few big national parks um, like Grand Canyon that have fire ecologists. Um, and then there are you know, some nonprofits, for example, the Nature Conservancy might have fire ecologists working for them. So uh, university, agency, nonprofit would be the, the probably main places you could work as a fire ecologist. You think they have to have, they have, to have a PhD to, to pursue that field? No, nope, there are at least a couple of examples of fire ecologists with master's degrees that I know of. And I'm, I think nowadays it'd be hard to get into that field without a master's degree, but I think historically there were people with um, college undergraduate degrees. So someone's asked a funny question. I wasn't going to sidebar and take any questions from the chat, but someone wants to know if you're a closet pyromaniac and <laughs> I'm kind of curious about that myself. <laughs> well, isn't everybody to some degree, you know, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think so. So um, fencing on that, I feel like I can't even call myself a true forester because I have seen one wildfire and it was tiny. Like it was so tiny. I think it was out within two seconds. So I'm wondering what was the first wildfire that you ever saw? I mean, was it, was it something that was massive or was it just something that was like little itty bitty? Um, I think I can't remember the, I'm not sure if I remember the very first one. I know the most impactful one because I, uh, was the Schultz fire, which occurred right outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. When I was living there, um, it, it happened in 2010. And I remember I was outside, I was playing soccer and I saw this big plume of smoke starting to rise up just over the ridge from, from where we were. And later that night we could see flames from downtown. Um, and it turned out to be about a 15,000 acre fire, which by today's standards is not really that huge, but in that location, it was a big deal. It really impacted the city. Um, it was you know, really close and a lot of people's homes were damaged by some of the post-fire mudslides and, and runoffs. So it was, um, it was, it was very eye-opening <clears throat> to already be studying fire and then have a fire hit so close to home. Yeah, and so you say that back then when you saw that, that wasn't that large. And I feel like that kind of hints at how fires are getting so much massive or so much larger, so much larger than typical um, these days. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about like what exactly is a mega fire? We hear this all the time on the news and see it in social media, mega fire this, mega fire that. But I think a lot of people don't really understand what exactly is that? Um, and were these things, were mega fires common historically or is this something that's just completely new? Yeah, so the megafire term is um, is not is not a scientific term necessarily. I don't know if it's been defined, but I think I've I've heard maybe over a hundred thousand acres, for example. But um, yeah, it it is a the, so large high impact fires are increasing. I think we're all aware of that. This past summer was a good example of that. 
Um, historically, there were some me mega fires, if you want to use that term. Um, the best example is 1910. Um, there was a huge amount of uh, area burned in the northwest of the United States, including Montana, Idaho, and some of the other northwestern states. I think it was somewhere in the 2 million range in Montana and Idaho, and then up to 5 million in, in the kind of larger Northwest. So um, that is an example of, of, of a mega fire. And it was, it was uh, there were strong winds combined with just tinder dry conditions and really hot temperatures. So that, that happened, but, but that was a shocking kind of, you know, anomalous event. It wasn't, it wasn't happening regularly. And so now I think the difference is we're seeing some of those types of events um, happening more frequently now, and especially since about the year 2000. Um, and this is also, I think, especially shocking because we went through a period of a hundred years where we had almost no fire across most, most of the West. So we're seeing this ramp up in fire activity um, and more of those quote unquote mega fires than historically probably happened. And I think part of that is to do with the fact that historically we had a lot more fire on the landscape. And so you would have had a fire burn and then maybe a few years later another fire, but then it would have you know, interact, you know, run into that previous fire footprint, maybe not gotten as large. So now we've got these really contiguous large expanses of fuels in the form of nice grown up forests and nothing really to break up these landscapes. So these mega fires have a lot of room to, to, keep, to keep burning. So there, there was a lot of fire and where did it come from? Did, was it all lightning? caused? Nope, there was a lot of uh, Native American burning as well. So it's thought that there was enough lightning in some areas to account for all the fires that we see in the record, but there are also a lot, there's a lot of um, evidence that in, in Native American peoples were also setting fires for all sorts of reasons, um, similar reasons to why we light prescribed fires today to reduce the risk of wildfire during the, the, the peak of the fire season, but also for hunting reasons, for agriculture, you know, to promote certain plants, um, to get rid of um, pests in, 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 the, uh, in the vegetation. So all sorts of reasons. So, so combination. So humans have been lighting fires for a long time. Do you think, it, it, is that something that was just an old practice or is that something we should be doing today? Yeah, so, well, around the world, people are still lighting a lot more fires than we are here in the West. So um, there are really neat graphics showing where fires are burning around the world. And the U.S. is barely lights up on that, on that world map. So people are still using it as a tool. And that's, I think, so I already mentioned those fires of 1910. Before that, there was an argument about whether we should be using fire as a tool or whether we should be putting out it, them out because they were wasting our natural resources. And after that 1910 fire, the, the fire protection side kind of won. And so we stopped, there was you know, a big push to stop using fire as a tool. Um, and, and the Forest Service, which was a kind of a new agency at the time, was afraid that if they let any crack through that argument, uh, people would, you know, not believe them that fire was bad. And so um, there was a push to eliminate fire. The Southeast never really did it. The Southeast has been burning throughout the entire 20th century. But yeah, there's a lot of arguments for why we should be having a lot more fire on the land. So I'm assuming we're going to talk about that too. So speaking of how the, you know, there was that big step for fire suppression and not letting things burn. I feel like that is also the same time around that Smokey Bear came to be. And so you know, I took a class when I was in my undergrad and we talked about Smokey Bear and how he was kind of a propaganda issue and how he really preached that there should be no fire. Fire is bad. And now it seems like we're kind of suffering the consequences of that mentality. So, I mean, what's your opinion on Smokey Bear? Do you have a, a friend or a foe attitude towards him? I mean, this is a common figure that people have known to grow and love and he may have done more harm than good. I don't know. I think that Smokey is, um, I think he's been a really effective tool. Again, he's, he has been, I think he's one of the longest or the longest running ad campaigns in the US. Um, and he's done a great job, I think, at educating people about putting campfires out. And I think that is something that is important. I think that 
random people should not be going around starting wildfires because they don't put their campfires out. Those are not necessarily maybe, you know, in a hot, dry, windy day, that's not really when you want a fire to start. So I think Smokey does a good job. Um, but I also think that it would be nice if he could have a little bit of a more nuanced message. Um, so he has changed his message. He used to say only you can prevent forest fires. And now he says only you can prevent wildfires. He's trying to make that distinction, but I'm not sure if it, it really, uh, if, if the distinction is made with the general public. There was um, something else I wanted to follow up on. You had mentioned that when you look at those maps that show where wildfire is happening across the globe, the US barely lights up. So that makes me wonder, do you feel like, like we need more prescribed burning in the US? It, you know, it sounds like they're using fire ecology in other countries. What can we do to embrace that more here? How can we get more fire on the landscape? So um, yeah, we definitely need more fire. I think prescribed fire is a wonderful tool. Um, I think in the Western US, the only problem with it is that it's just not at the scale that we need it to be. It's, it's just tiny compared to the scale of uh, what's, what has been coined the fire deficit. We are in this hole. We owe the landscape a lot more fire than it's been seeing. And so, um, so it's not keeping up with the scale right now. I think we have some challenges here that other places that use prescribed fire more often don't have. One is the rugged topography. So it makes it more challenging to, um, to have a fire be effective and safe when you're working in really steep mountainous terrain. And it's a lot easier if you're on flat ground, for example. Um, but I think that we need a lot more resources put into it. Um, you know, we spend almost all of the Forest Service budget now goes towards fire suppression. So there's billions of dollars being put towards suppression, putting fires out. And so I think we need, uh, you know, if we had a matching number of funds towards fuels management, including prescribed fire, I think we would make a, a big difference. Yeah. Uh, don't prescribed fires get away? Isn't that dangerous, lighting fires? So it's true that every once in a while one does, but it's really, really rare. Unfortunately, those are the ones that make the news. <laughs> it's, it's much, much smaller than 1%. So what goes into a prescribed fire? You said we shouldn't just let our campfires go. Why can't the average person light a prescribed fire compared to a, does it take a fire ecologist? Well, in some places, you know, uh, private landowners are lighting their own fires. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a professional. And actually, Darren, with the prescribed fire councils around the country, those are good resources for people who may have their own land and want to do prescribed fires on their property. Um, but on federal land, it does take um, a professional because there are a lot of regulations about um, the, the um, smoke conditions, for example. So they have to make sure they're burning on days when smoke is going to disperse away from populated areas. Um, they, they have prescriptions, so that means that they know they, they, they know exactly what effects they want the fire to have. So for example, sometimes you are trying to kill some small trees. So you know, okay, well, how hot does my fire need to be? Um, and then you work backwards from there and, and then you can figure out what the weather conditions are that are gonna give you that fire behavior to meet those landscape objectives. So um, that whole chain um, with people with experience know which, which days they need to, you know, wait for in order to, to meet those, those objectives. So you mentioned fire behavior, and I'm wondering if you could maybe give us a little bit more on that. What exactly is fire behavior? What makes fire behave the way that it does? Okay, so there is what's called a fire behavior triangle, and that is an easy way to remember the three things that affect fire behavior. So one leg of the triangle is topography. And so, for example, uh, Fires tend to move faster up steep slopes. So topography is an important um, factor. And then um, fuels, fuels is another leg. So that means all of the vegetation, what kind of, how much dead down material do you have? What kind of trees do you have? What kind of shrubs do you have? How dense are those fuels? Those all things all impact how fire behaves. And then weather is the third leg of the triangle. So that means hot, dry, and windy. Those are the sort of the three things with low relative humidity that would increase fire behavior. And then in the middle of the triangle is fire itself because when fires get really intense and hot and large, they can influence their own behavior. They start to create their own winds, for example. So 
So fuels, topography, and weather, and then fire itself. Those are the things that influence how fire behaves. So you talk about fire being able to create its own wind. Um, is that what we would consider a fire tornado? That is a special uh, example of, of uh, fire creating its own wind, but there are other situations as well. Um, so uh, in, you can find videos of this on YouTube, but in massive wildfires, they, there's so much energy being released up. They draw wind, they draw, have to draw air in at the base of the, of the fire in order to send all that energy up into the sky. And so there can be winds coming into a fire area. And then sometimes those clouds, those pyrocumulus clouds collapse and they push wind then out from the fire. Um, and they, those can really spread fire quickly when those things happen. Um, when fire tornadoes happen, those, so there's fire, there's sort of the spectrum of, of spinning fire. And one is fire whirls, which is kind of similar to the little dust doubles that everyone has seen in kind of dry, windy conditions. And then fire tornadoes seem to be kind of a different level where it really, you can get these massive uh, spinning columns that again, has to do with just how much energy is being released up, the wind coming in. And if it gets, starts to get this rotating patterns when these fire tornadoes can can start, but they're really rare. Yeah. That all sounds overwhelming. How, how could we possibly stop fires? What, what, what strategy do we use moving forward to stop these huge fires? Yeah, well, so in some cases, clearly suppression is needed, right? Near towns, near cities, near what's called the wildland urban interface, the WUI. Those are, the, in those areas, suppression is needed and, you know, when you have really extreme fire behavior like that, there's not a lot firefighters can do. Uh, there's nothing you can do in the face of a fire tornado. Um, I think that the, the technology that's been developed, you know, the aircraft can be effective in, in you know, but a pretty small scale. So larger, you know, strategy of fuels management is, you know, when you think about that fire triangle, fuels, weather, topography, the only thing we can really change is the fuels. So that's, that's really where the efforts need to go to change um, fire before they start. And that would be, you know, putting some more prescribed fires on the landscape to eliminate those fuels. So in, in places that are having those persistent wildfires like California, um, they might benefit from doing more fuels treatments maybe, or do you think it's just the weather plays too much of a role out in California? I think it is definitely a combination. So we have, it's really hard to assign exactly how much of this change that we're seeing is due to changing climate versus the fuels question. It's no question it's, it's both of those things that have contributed to some of the, the you know, devastating impacts that we're seeing in recent years. Um, so prescribed fire is one way to, in, you know, uh, change fuels, but there are other fuels treatments as well. Um, Mechanical thinning of, of forests, for example, you can cut cut trees out. There's also all sorts of you know machinery that can also do the work. But although prescribed fire is, is all really effective too. So, but different different tools are more useful in, in particular locations, um, just based on the local area, like slope or you know distance to a urban area or whatever, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So California could use more prescribed fire too, it sounds like, and other Western states. And so if you were queen for a day or for a year, how, how much prescribed, how much more prescribed fire would you want to see on the land? Um, there are estimates of that. You know, I think that we would need to burn, we, we are millions and millions of acres behind in terms of how much fire needs to get out on the landscape. Um, and it, you know, it's not as, as easy as just going to put with a drip torch or a match because now we have people that have built cabins in wildland, you know, areas. Um, we do have sensitive communities that have, you know, asthma and other respiratory issues that smoke, they're smoke sensitive. So I think, you know, I, I am empathetic with the federal land managers. It, it is really hard. Um, I think there's no one in the agencies that everyone knows that we need more fire on the landscape. It's just, there are so many barriers that are, that people are, are, are up against. So 
it's not that I have the solutions and no one else has them. It's just a really tough situation. But I do think that having more resources would help. Um, and I think that stuff like this, where, you know, I get to talk about fire with, um, with people from all over, I think that's a really valuable and, uh, really neat thing to get to do. Um, because I think that one of the things that would help is if there were a groundswell of support for more fire on the ground. I think that would help our, our public land managers. I have, um, kind of a change of pace question completely unrelated to what you were just saying. So I'm sorry to just jump on off topic, but this is a question that I am really interested to hear your answer. So what are the coolest, like most unique, fascinating fire ecosystems on the planet in your opinion? Okay. Well, there's a really, I, I would, I'll give this example of, uh, just a really fascinating, uh, thing that can happen in Australia. So there, Australia is one of the continents that sees a lot of fire. Um, it's, there's a lot of fire prone landscapes, a lot of plants that are dependent on fire, but there are some birds there that, um, it's never been caught on video, so you can't go see it yourself, but a lot of people have seen this. Um, they, they hunt at, right at the edge of the fire because lizards and small birds and insects and uh, little rodents come you know, rushing out of the fire. Um, and so they hunt and it's just a feeding frenzy. Um, and so people have seen these birds there. Um, there's a few different types. I think one is called the black kite and they pick up burning sticks and they'll fly with them to a new area and drop them. So they're, they're, cool. they're starting their, 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 their starting fires away from the main fire just to continue, uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the buffet. So that's I think that's cool. a really cool example. <laughs> that's sneaky, those sneaky little birds, huh? Wow, <laughs> I was not expecting that answer. That's really interesting. I'm gonna have to go YouTube that later for sure. <laughs> So if you could observe fire and it's the fire effects anywhere on the planet, where would you choose? Well, I think I, so a couple places, I would love to get up to um, Alaska and the Boreal. I've never been there and I would really love to see some of the fire effects there. Um, that's probably, I think that'll, that'll happen. I'm slowly working my way north of, over time. So I would love to do that. And then there are, South Africa is another place that, uh, you know, I think partly from being cooped up for the last nine months, you know, just getting somewhere far flung sounds great. Mm -hmm. But um, in that area, there are, uh, there's an ecosystem. It's, it's kind of a Mediterranean environment um, where almost every plant there is fire dependent and they have really neat fire adaptations. For example, they're uh, stimulated by smoke to germinate. And so these places need fire um, to to persist on the landscape. And I, I think that would be, that's another kind of life goal to get over there and see some of those places. So you said something I wanna come back to uh, when you're talking about the Australian example and the black kite, you said critters run out from the fire. Do fires kill a lot of animals? Should we be concerned about that? They, um, I, mean, I certainly they would kill small animals that can't get away in quick moving fires, but actually it's a lot less than you'd expect. So any animal that can burrow um, can get down, get down away from the heat far enough into the soil. Um, a lot of animals survive that way. And then bigger animals are usually able to just get, you know, move or fly. So the, the only times that, fi that fires directly harm animals are, for example, uh, birds that are in the nestling phase where they can't fly um, or any other life stage where they're not mobile. Um, Every once in a while, you hear about, um, you know, animal mortality. So last actually went winter here, summer for Australia, you, there were a lot of koalas in the news from Australia. Um, and that was, you know, per, yeah, and platypus actually as well. They were having some issues with some of their, their, their uh, native animals because the fires were so big and so fast moving. But a lot of examples here for even the Yellowstone fires, which were, uh, couple million acres in 1988, there were examples of bison just calmly grazing, you know, within a hundred feet of these hundred foot flames. They just really aren't, don't seem to be very affected. And for the most part, and in, in fact, often come back in greater numbers uh, than before after a fire, because um, in a lot of places, green up happens where the forage grasses and, and, and little plants are 
more nutritious and more um, abundant after a fire. So there can be some direct mortality, but in a lot of cases, it's actually beneficial, you know, over the long run. I feel like if I was a bison, I would not be phased by anything either. I would probably just be doing the exact same thing. <laughs> they are pretty, they're, yeah, they're, they're pretty tank-like. So I think we're going to go ahead and get into our rapid fire portion now. So I'm just going to throw these questions at you, try and answer them as quickly as you can. Um, let's get this going. So what are some of the best precautions to prevent wildfires? I think that, you know, putting campfire out, campfires still start a really shocking number of fire fires. And so making sure it's dead out where you can put your hand in there and it's actually cool to the touch um, is one of the best ways you can prevent wildfires as an individual. What's the best strategy to reduce fire danger to mitigate fires? Well, I think we need more we need more fire. So we keep, we keep talking about this, but we need more fire that's not burning in the hottest, driest, windiest days of the year. So that's when we're typically seeing the fires happen now. And so of course they're, they're devastating. They have negative ecological consequences and they, they burn people's homes down. But if we had more Are you there, Darren? I'm there. Okay, let's hope that she comes back. She's only a couple doors down. I'll put my mask on and go check in. Okay. Well, time out for a second here, guys. I'm really sorry about the technical difficulties. Life with um, life this way, I guess, you know, uh, this is just something unfortunately we have to do. I'm gonna go ahead and put a poll out. Um, if you don't need to do it right now. You can wait until we're getting closer to the end if you want to. But I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there so you can get that going whenever you're ready. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this new format. I am glad she was right next door. <laughs> this was very convenient. So Larissa's is going to come talk from my computer. Okay. You're not, you can take your mask off or just stand up. Okay. You can do whatever you think is best. So I'll just attack you with these wildfire questions or these rapid fire questions. Um, I cannot remember what the last question he had asked was. So we're just going to jump right to the next one unless you have a train of thought going in your mind. I can't remember what the question was now either. Sorry. Okay. What is mixed severity fire? Okay, so severity has to do with the impact on the ecosystem. So low severity would be um, low, for example, low tree mortality. So not very many trees killed. High severity, you'd have a lot of trees killed. So mixed severity is anywhere in between there. So it's actually not a very useful term because it describes almost every fire. It's uh, a, a mix, it, but I guess when, when uh, additional comment is that mixed severity could be really fine grained. So you could have every other tree killed, although that's pretty unusual, or you could have patches of low severity where not very many trees were killed next to high severity where you do have um, high mortality. Does fire change soil composition? So um, what can happen, one really interesting thing that can happen with soil and fire is that a layer of hydrophobicity can be formed. So what hydrophobic soil is, Hydro is water, phobic is fear. And so it's it's like afraid of water. And so if you have a soil that's hydrophobic, you drop a little drop of water on it and it actually just beads up, it doesn't soak in. And so fire can create that hydrophobic soil. Um, and what happens is it, it's, it's, it comes from um, kind of waxy compounds in plants and it kind of, it basically turns into a gaseous form and then forms into the soil. And then what can happen later is that if there's a rainstorm, the water isn't able to soak in and it just takes all that soil off the slope with it. So that's how, that's one of the ways that soil can be really impacted. So is it possible to restore hydrophobic soils after a severe well, fire? Well, so hydrophobic soils just kind of break down over time. Um, they do occur naturally without fire as well. So they, you can find them in places that haven't burned. Um, and the, the biggest thing is to prevent erosion of soil after fire. That's the, one of the top priorities of anybody in, on steep slopes is to prevent soil from washing off. Once it's washed off, it's really hard. It takes, you know, it could take thousands of years to get 
soil development back. So it's uh, it's better to not let it go to, in the first place. The other way to help soil after a fire is to get roots back in. And so planting grasses or trees that um, roots are the best way to stabilize soil. So that's, that's often a, a priority after a fire. Awesome. Is anybody looking at the, this one's interesting. Is anybody, they're all interesting, sorry. <laughs> Is anybody looking at the effect of fire on native bee populations? I think that's such a great question. I don't know of anybody, um, but I think that that would be a really interesting idea. Yeah. I would sort of think that the, it, it's possible again that fire could be beneficial to native bees if it's able to promote those species that native bees um, need. So that's a great question. I don't know. That would be something worth looking into for sure. Um, how do you prevent, how can you prevent water pollution after an intense fire? Um, so that's kind of goes along with the soil erosion idea. Basically, um, there's a lot of attention right after a fire um, on, on federal land in the West where um, people go immediately, sometimes before the fire is even out, to look at those impacts on soil and water after a fire. And there's a lot of treatments out there, um, a lot of options, for example, hill slope treatments to try to slow the movement of water down. And um, so that could be like logs felled across the slope, for example. And there's also treatments that can go in channels like little check dams to try to slow that water down and let this, the sediment infiltrate um, instead of being washed all the way down to a reservoir, for example. So it's really hard to prevent ash from getting run, you know, runoff, but there's a lot of treatments that are designed to try to, you know, reduce that large scale debris flows that really could impact um, water um, quality and, and quantity in the future. So are, are these techniques that are implemented after a fire has started or are these techniques that are implemented with the intention that fire is probably going to hit that landscape? You know, it's after a fire has already started. So it's always done. It's done basically, uh, there's a team that goes out right after a fire. So yeah, again, sometimes while it's still burning to assess those impacts that are going to happen to post-fire um, aquatic resources. How are forest insects and diseases impacted by fire? That's a great question. And it's, it's a really complicated answer because there's so many insects and diseases out there. Um, in some cases, a fire could thin out a forest where, you know, and you'd have less tree density. So fewer trees per acre. That could actually reduce the, the risk of fire or sorry, insects from attacking forests. Um, in other cases, if fire weakens trees and reduces their defenses, um, that could increase the potential for, for insects to attack trees. So really, I think it depends on the fire and it depends what the insect needs for, um, for its host, you know, host uh, characteristics. So this would be like a piggyback question to that. Um, does the bark, does the bark beetle kill no, I'm sorry, I'm misreading. Does the beetle kill impact fire ecology? Does it make fires worse? Yeah, another great question. These are such good questions. Um, this that is is focus of a lot of research. There, it's kind of a mixed story on that. So it's right now it's thought that so after a beetle attack, trees go through um, kind of a weakened phase where they still look green, but their defenses are low, and they're starting to their foliage is starting to dry out. Then they get into this red phase where their needles are dead and they're super dry. And then there's the gray phase where all the needles have fallen off. So it's thought that in the first couple of years after a beetle attack, that's a high risk of, um, of fire. But then in subsequent years, you actually get reduced risk of crown fire, at least because you've lost all the needles and they're just these kind of, you know, solitary uh, trees with no needles all over. But again, but then again, it, it will change again over time. So 20 or 30 years later, you've got all those trees that have fallen down and those are now fuel. So those can contribute to intense fires if a fire were to burn in those areas. What's a crown fire? Crown fire is a fire that burns through the canopies of trees up in, in the needles or the, or the leaves. And that's opposed, as opposed to a surface fire that burns through the grasses and shrubs that are on the ground. Is one more dangerous or does one do more impact to the fire ecology than the other? Yeah, so, um, well, and so uh, a lot of times what, what, what we are thinking we wanna get rid of are those crown fires. Those are the ones that are 
tend to be much harder to control um, and, and dangerous. However, there are ecosystems that depend on crown fires. And a great example in the West is lodgepole pine where crown fires are the natural way that those fires burn. And in fact, their, their seeds open up with the heat of those, of those crown fires and they're able to regenerate after those very high intensity fires. So, so even though we think of crown fires as kind of, we put this label on them that they're bad, there are places where that's the way they've always burned and they still need to burn that way. This is a complex subject. It's not clear <laughs> black and white answers, are there? Yeah, that's why it's continually fascinating. It's also a tough subject to do rapid fire with because it's just very expansive <laughs> answers. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no, don't apologize. We're all here to learn, so this is great. What are the ways that people are beginning to or continuing to incorporate indigenous knowledge about around fire ecology? Yeah, that's a good question too. So, um, uh, well, so we've talked a little bit about how Native Americans used fire historically for lots of different reasons. And actually, um, some of the uh, tribal areas were some of the first to start reintroducing fire back in the 50s. Um, in eastern Washington and northern Arizona, there were there were some um, tribal areas that yeah, were getting fire back on the landscape as, as early as, you know, now it's been seven decades ago. So there are efforts all over, including Northern California. There's lots of good examples of places where um, those cultural burning practices are starting to be brought back and people are trying to learn from them. Um, and there's another great example in Eastern Arizona, the White Mountain Apache tribe is doing just a tremendous amount of fire, both prescribed fire, but also managed wildfire where there's a natural lightning start. And then they, instead of just like jumping on it to suppress it, they are um, allowing it to achieve some resource benefits, which is basically what we've been talking about, reducing fuels, um, opening up the canopy to you know, reduce the risk of bark beetle infestation, all sorts of the good things about fire, they're using these wildfires to achieve. So they're, they're really a leader in, um, in putting, you know, putting fire back on the landscape. So there's good examples of that. Awesome. Can't we use fire to control the invasive species problems? Won't we just burn them all up? Um, well, there may be cases, there may be some invasives where that would work, but uh, cheatgrass is unfortunately the big example of how it loves fire. And there's actually a lot of invasives that do really well with fire. So fire just promotes cheatgrass. That's actually one reason where we don't see a lot of prescribed fire in the Great Basin anymore because um, even though it was historically a natural part of this ecosystem, now it's really hard to do fire without just getting more cheap grass back than before you started. What is cheatgrass? Cheatgrass is a little invasive grass that is a prolific seeder. It produces millions and millions of seeds. Um, it's from, I think it's from uh, Asia originally. And it was brought here, I think, as a forage grass back in long, some, uh, so early 20th century. But um, it's really, it's just become, um, it's driven out a lot of native species and it, it does promote fire, which then drives out sagebrush and other native species because they can't, they can't keep up with how frequent the fire is with the cheatgrass uh, dominant, dominant ecosystem. And then it just promotes itself. It's called the grass fire cycle. Can how, go ahead, Darren. Can you talk about fire and climate change? How could we possibly want more fire and more smoke? And you suggest prescribed fire, but we have all this talk of climate change. How, how does that all fit together? Yeah, so climate change, yeah, that, I mean, that's it's part of the issues that we're dealing with is that we do have these hotter, drier conditions that are becoming more frequent already. And so um, I think. Well, and so this is getting really complicated too. This is a really hard issue to do a rapid or question to do rapid fire answer. But um, I think to give our ecosystems the best chance at, um, at, at surviving whatever's coming next, I think they need to be in a, in, in a condition where they're not overcrowded, they're not choked with fuels. Um, so that's, that's an argument for trying to prepare these ecosystems for, for the changes that we know are coming. Um, it's thought that climate change is going to impact fire through a few different pathways that we've kind of talked about. Ignitions is one, which we don't really know. That's not, it's kind of minor, but then fuel amount, 
and fuel moisture. Those are the ways that climate change is going to impact um, how fires burn. So how much fuels on the landscape and how dry it is. So you can see that going different ways in different ecosystems, depending on whether they, it gets increased precipitation or less. But no matter what, it's getting hotter and that does result in lower relative humidities and usually um, less fuel moisture. So we're gonna continue to see fire in the landscape. I think that's one thing that it would be nice to just acknowledge is that there isn't a way to get rid of fire. We can't unless we pave everything because again, plants are fuel. So fire is gonna burn. And I think we just, we have a little bit of a choice in how it burns, but really not whether it burns. So I feel like we, we addressed the invasive species question, but if you use fire to get rid of an invasive species like thistle, are you risking that just coming back 10 times worse? Yes, I think so. I think it would, so, well, and so um, there's, there are techniques where, you know, knowing kind of when a, a plant flowers, for example, you would want to time a, a burn right so that you get it right before it, you know, right where it's, it's, it's low on carbohydrates. So it doesn't have a lot of resources to come back after a prescribed fire. And then, but also before it's put out its seeds. So you'd want to, you'd want to get the timing really, really, per, you know, really good so that you don't accidentally promote something you're trying to get rid of. Is there, a, is there a difference in fire ecology depending on savanna grasslands versus forests? Well, in one way, no. I mean, it's all, it's all plants and it's, all, you know, fire is the same thing no matter what. It just, it would behave differently in those different things. Um, and then, you know, um, but on the other hand, you know, different plants and different ecosystems have different adaptations to fire where some are able to re-sprout, um, some are able to, you um, with really thick bark resist death. Um, so I think it just, it, because you have different species in those different savanna versus forest, you might have differences, but um, you know, and there's also, I could go on and on, but I think that it's a yes and no kind of question. So uh, somebody asked from the audience, I think a really good question. Can't we just answer this problem with logging? And there was some reference to this in the news quite a bit this summer that, it's all about mismanagement in California. Can you uh, explain that? Yeah, and so, I mean, I think that um, logging does have a role to play in some areas. It's possible that we could, you know, we prescribe fire is not the only tool. There are also mechanical or, you know, chainsaw. Uh, that, that's another tool that can be used. Um, but one of the problems is that um, what needs to be cut out are tend to be these small diameter trees. They're, um, you know, don't have any worth to them in terms of the wood. And so it's, you, it's really, in a lot of cases, it's hard to get the value, uh, you know, get the money back for the treatment. And so it's still, it's costing a lot more, um, you know, it doesn't pay for itself. There's also regulations like wilderness areas, um, riparian areas. There's, I think there's been a study that shows that, you know, logging would only be possible on 20 or 30% of the, of the forests out there. So it is a solution, but it's not, it can't work everywhere and it is expensive where, where the trees don't pay for themselves at the mill. So we're um, coming near the end here. So I wanna ask you, Larissa, I know that I gave you a little sneak peek at the questions. Was there a question that we didn't get to that you were super excited to ask? Or Darren, was there a question that you really wanted to ask that we haven't been able to get to yet? I can't remember. I remember thinking that there were just an amazing number of good questions, but I don't, I, we, I, Darren and I have switched offices now. So I don't, I don't know. Oh, how about this one? Uh, what? Should a graduate student pursue? What should a, what should a student pursue if they want to pursue this field? Well, I think that oh, that's it's a great question. I think that um, I think that the answers are um, all over the map. I, I really think that what we have right now is this just grand challenge of figuring out how we can live with fire and reduce the negative impacts of fire on human communities. And so I think there's so many good good research, so much good research going on. I, I actually don't feel like I wanna narrow that scope down. I think that there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on and uh, anywhere in that realm where we, 
personally, I really like applied research, um, you know, where we're trying to figure out solutions to all these problems we've been talking about today. Um, but I also think some of the basic research is really important too. So I'm going to wrap it up with, um, Sorry, with two, two final questions and they're piggybacking on one another. So what is your favorite part about your job and what you do every day? Um, two things actually, one, well, there's, I, I love what I do. I've already convinced you, hopefully, I think this is the most fascinating topic. I feel so lucky I get to, to think about fire all the time. One of the good things about it is the colleagues that I have. I think it's really fun. I think that's a really fun part of being a scientist that maybe people don't think about is all the collaborations and the, the fun conversations and, you know, putting heads together that happens. I really love that. Um, and then the other thing I really love is getting out into forests and wildlands. And I have found myself so many times over the years thinking that there's no way I would get to uh, a random spot on the landscape. I'm somewhere off a trail far from a road and I'm only there because I need to put a plot in there. And it's just been, there's so many times when I've been like, felt lucky to, to, to be, you know, with this amazing view or some interesting thing I come across. So I love the field work part of it too. And then what would your least favorite part of the job be? I, um, I don't like grading student papers. I love reading them, but I, I really hate the grading part. <laughs> <laughs> That's Very nice well. and honest. <laughs> Well, we want to thank you so much for doing this with us today, Larissa. You were pretty much our guinea pig as this was our first episode, but I think that this went really great and I think it was a lot of fun. I hope that everybody who attended today had fun and learned a bit. Um, we're trying to do this to introduce the wonderful professionals who work these various fields. A lot of people don't know much about these different fields that we're going to introduce through this series. Um, and I think it's just a great way to help the public and help everybody just learn more and nerd out about really cool natural resource stuff because I mean we're all here because we love something about natural resources right so this is just a really cool way to get this stuff out there so if anybody has any feedback or anything that they would like to give us we would love to hear that so feel free to email me um, you should have gotten my email when you registered but I'll put it here in the chat box we would just love to hear back from you um, and thank you so much Larissa for doing this today we're so grateful to have had you and Darren thank you so much for co-hosting um, if anybody has anything else they want to say, otherwise I'm just going to close it out. I just want to say thank you as well. It's been a really, really great opportunity. I had, I had fun. And, and Gabrielle, I was wondering if you could save the chat. I know there were lots of interesting comments and questions that came in and I didn't have time to read them. So that would be one, one request for me. Yes, I will figure out how I can save that, definitely. Okay. And there mm -hmm. were also a lot more questions that we didn't get to. So I'll email those to you and if you have time, over, it might take you like a year, but if you have time to get through them, I'm sure some people would love to hear back and maybe we'll even have you back just to answer these other questions that we had. Thank you. And Gabrielle, could you put up uh, our website resources? Uh, people can sign up for the Utah Forest News. And if you want more information about this sort of thing going on in Utah and the Intermountain West, and we work with the Utah Biomass Resources Group. We're doing a lot of fire related work there. Um, and perhaps Larissa has a website uh, to share as well. All right, I have put all that information in the chat. Um, thank you so much for everybody who attended and we will keep you posted with January's episode, which I am very much looking forward to. So thanks everybody, have a great day. Thanks, thanks. Gabrielle, thanks Larissa, good job. <laughs>